basically we all know about how common this cancer still is uh, for us. And in, in India, what happened actually the last global can was that it has moved from being number one cancer amongst the women to number two. That is the change we've had. It's now number two after breast cancer. Previously, it was breast cancer was number one in the urban areas, but now countrywide, this is the most important. And we have 23% of the world's burden here. We have 123,000 new cases in India and 67,000 deaths. So they're still coming in a lot of advanced uh, cancers coming in, but it is changing. And in India too, we are seeing an increasing number of patients with early stage cancer. So that is one shift we are observing. And we are also seeing it in the childbearing years in women who have not completed their fertility, which numbers are very small because Indian women still do tend to get married early and have their families early. But it is a shift we are seeing. So the uh, potential for conservation is coming in. And of course, we've heard about prognostic factors, which are pretty universal, I think, across the board for all cancers. The t stage at time of diagnosis, lymph node, meds, tumor size, histological type. And what we're talking about right now, the 1B, which in uh, FIGO revised in 2009 to divide between a 1B1 and a 1B2, recognizing essentially the potential of larger tumors to be associated with more of LVSI, more of lymph node involvement, more of distant spread, and the need for adjuvant therapies. So there is a, cl a clear distinction there. But does that mean that we can clearly divide the methodology of treatment is what we need to see. And if we look at the various types of treatment that we have, essentially for the stage 1B1 to the 2A2, the treatment is a type 3 radical hysterectomy with a pelvic lymphadenectomy. As far as uh, the radiation goes, it's either a primary treatment or an adjuvant treatment, and it is for the most part now a combined uh, chemo radiation approach and not just a radiation approach once we come to the 1B2s for sure, but more and more centers are using it universally for the 1B1. And we also have now the potential for radical trachelectomy in the 1B1 cases for sure, and there are some centers who are now looking at it for 1B2 as well, but again, we must remember that the potential for spread and involvement and all being greater, this is still doubtful as far as radical trachelectomy goes, but for 1B1, for sure. And of course, uh, we still continue to use this class three as uh, type three uh, uh, definition is easier, but there are many places now where they would use the curlo moro classification and call it as a type C2. And what we are looking to remove is the ureters fully mobilized, the sectioning of uterosacral ligaments at the level of the rectum, sectioning of vesicouterine ligaments at the level of the bladder, complete resection of the paracervical tissue, and 15 to 20 millimeters from the vagina resected towards the cervix or tumor and correspondent paracolpus. And this one does not involve the preservation of the autonomic nerves. If you preserve the autonomic nerves, what we like to call the nerve sparing radical, then that falls as a type C1. So you're looking now for the option between these two, the radical hysterectomy plus minus the bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. The ovaries don't always need to be removed because there's less than 1% chance that they may be involved, but if they're adenocarcinoma, for sure they're always removed. I think in this matter, the practice varies a little bit between people. Some people like to just remove them always, but there are others who would retain an ovary in a younger woman if it is a small lesion and a squamous cell lesion, and we generally follow that practice. And essentially, both these methods for the stage one have equally effective five-year survival rates of 87 to 90%, 2%, but yes, they do differ in morbidity and complications. So when you decide which treatment to go, you need to look at the age and the desire to preserve ovarian function, which, as I said, is very, very possible for younger age patients and a lot of stage one patients. Comorbid conditions, associated gynae conditions requiring surgery, because if she has a fibroid that is distorting the cavity or a tubo ovarian mass that might flare up with radiation and so on. The treatment toxicity, the facilities and expertise available. And at this point, I would like to say that for India, we often err on the side of surgery 
because of the lack of radiation facilities, because of the long waiting lists, and because of the fact that in many, many centers, even our gynecologists in medical colleges and so many of the uh, hospitals are trained to perform radical hysterectomies, even those who do not have gynecology training otherwise. The patient's choice is important, and most patients will say, I really want this out. And there are some who will, very few who will say that they are happy to go the radiation route. Most patients would really prefer surgery. So the combination of surgery and radiotherapy, we must always remember, has the worst morbidity. So it is very, very important to identify as far as possible preoperatively whether you think you are really going to require adjuvant radiation because then the answer clearly is to just go one shot, only radiotherapy. So if we look at the Cochrane review for primary surgery or primary radiotherapy in squamous cell carcinoma, for early squamous cell carcinomas, the outcome is similar after either primary surgery or primary radiotherapy. And there are many studies that have looked at this, but really the only prospective trial was the landmark one by Landoni et al. in 1997, in which they looked at 337 patients with stage 1b or 2a and they did the class three surgeries and gave adjuvant therapies if there was any pathological risk factor. And the radiotherapy was essentially a median of 76 gray at point A. And they found a five year survival of 70% after primary surgery versus 59% after primary radiotherapy, but no evidence of disease at five years. They found 66% after surgery versus 47% radiation. But the complication related to the surgery were more and as compared to the radiation. <clears throat> there have been other studies which looked and they find more or less the same survival between the surgery and the radiotherapy. And uh, when they look at the core specific survival, so it's important also to have the core specific survival. For early adenocarcinoma, the story is not quite the same. The Cochrane has looked at that and found that early adenocarcinomas do better with surgery than with radiotherapy and primary chemoradiation remains a second best alternative. And chemotherapy is probably the first choice in patients who have MRI or PET-CT suspected positive lymph nodes. With primary surgery, you have the advantage of more accurate staging information, removal of the primary t uh, tumor, resection of the bulky nodes that are less likely to be sterilized with radiotherapy, detection of pathologic node involvement, allowing direction of adjuvant, and then it leaves the potential to treat subsequent pelvic relapses with radiation. You can preserve the gonads, you can limit the shortening and fibrosis of the uh, vagina, and most importantly, as Dr. Somashekar pointed out, even if you have complications, you detect them in time and you treat them in time and you can correct them. The biggest problem that we do have to face is the chronic neurogenic bladder, which has been partly tackled by the use of laparoscopy, nerve sparing radical hysterectomy, for the early cases and t doing the sentinel nodes and um, looking at, uh, uh, I mean, how much of the lymphadenectomy needs to be done. So all of this, part of it is proven, part of it is under, but there is the potential there. And uh, the potential need for a, a juven post-operative radiotherapy to reduce the risk of local recurrence, depending upon risk factors, is always the fear that you are with that will you have to combine the treatment. About 50 to 85% of patients with stage 1B to 2A will need adjuvant. We looked at our own data and we found that 70% of stage 1B2 patients did need to go for primary, uh, for uh, saying when we looked at our uh, data in the years when we started with the concurrent chemo radiation. And the risk of pelvic lymph node involvement when the tumor is less than two centimeters, about 6%, six, uh, 6%, but when the tumor goes over four centimeters, it's as high as 36%. And this is actually the basis for differentiating the 1B1 and 1B2. We have now, of course, the newer modalities that we are talking about here. And the results of laparoscopic total uh, radical hysterectomies are quite comparable with the abdominal and the preliminary results of robotic surgery also. And we've discussed all these points of which improves uh, and which doesn't. So these are, of course, ready to set the stage. Now, with the primary radiotherapy, it's easy for patients who are obese, elderly, or they have severe comorbidities. You avoid the risks of anesthesia to a large extent. I mean, the, you will require some anesthesia, but not as long and not as much. And the scar, if it's a laparotomy. But there are problems at which can be often permanent and fairly debilitating. 
the lymphedema and the radiation cystitis, proctitis, coital problems, which you don't have much of solution for, and they carry on. Having said that, improved techniques of radiotherapy have also helped us to decrease the amount of cystitis, proctitis, and all these problems, and we don't see them as much as we used to. Of course, the high-risk factors are well known, the lymph node metastasis, positive margins, parametrial extension. If any of these factors are there, they go to adjuvant. If they're intermediate, you need two or more of these factors, the deep invasion, LVSI, and the tumor size more than four centimeters to go there. And of course, uh, the adjuvant concurrent chemo radiation, weekly cisplatin with or without 5-fluorosil was the way it started, but now a lot more uh, things are being tried. And this improves the overall survival, progression-free survival in both local and distant recurrences compared with pelvic irradiation alone in such patients. There are also various, the pathologists are busy as we are trying to work out ways, so they've worked out their own scores on what is the one which is going to uh, have a, uh, I mean, is there a way to uh, provide some information for survival and management? The Cochrane has looked at the adjuvant radiotherapy and chemo radiation after surgery and they find that the radiation decreases the risk of disease progression compared with no further treatment, but little evidence that it might provide overall survival. And this review, the evidence on serious adverse events was equivocal. But really, if we look at the complications of radical hysterectomy, you will have 3 to 13% of chronic bladder dysfunction, 1 to 2% of fistulas, of pulmonary embolism, small bowel obstruction, lymphocele in as many as 5 to 8%, and hydroureteronephrosis in 3%. If you look at the complications of radiotherapy, they have proctitis in almost 7%, and edema in 0.6, hydroureteronephrosis a bit more in 5%, and VVFs is the same. But if you look at combination of surgery followed by radiotherapy, the hydroureteronephrosis jumps to 10%, severe edema 9%, lymphocytes in 15%, the fistulas in 7%, the cycle complications, bowel morbidity, and so clearly this is what is to be avoided, the combination of methods. And to add to the choices that we had, we now have the possibility of doing neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by either a radical hysterectomy or, and with or without the CCRT. There are also trials to see neoadjuvant chemotherapy going directly to uh, CCRT for that matter. But we don't really have the comparison uh, RCTs. And you have <coughs> Neville Hacker's paper on the primary surgical management with tailored adjuvant radiation for stage 1b2 cancers, where they say that when they found that there were tumors which had just uh, maybe just a little bit of infiltration locally, but not really the involvement of the lymph nodes, that they made a small field subsequently and gave them a small uh, field of radiation with which they found that there was really not that much uh, long-term radiation morb uh, morbidity, and there was a good five-year survival. So a primary radical hysterectomy with a tailored post-op adjuvant radiation for patients with stage 1b2 cervical cancer can give you good survival with acceptably low morbidity. And I think this is what we need to do, and we need to see the role of NSCT in these because it definitely gives you a chance to give uh, fewer patients the radiotherapy, improving the outcome of your surgery. And this is one of the trials which has looked at the modified preoperative. So there's a lot of those uh, schemes going on here. In this one, they have tried, for example, cisplatin, mitromycin, and 5-FU, and various people have tried various regimes. But the responders definitely had a longer tumor-free survival compared to the non-responders. It's always a concern that if you have a non-responder, you have further delayed the surgery, but you have to take uh, the grain with the chaff, I guess. And so um, uh, the ones who are responding have definitely got a better advantage there. And uh, <clears throat> looking at the Cochrane review on this new adjuvant chemotherapy plus surgery, they definitely found that there were outcomes tending to be in favor of NSCT, but the overall survival, uh, it was, I mean, not clear whether it consistently offers a benefit or not, but definitely it does seem to reduce the need for post-op radiation. So patients with early stage cervical cancer may be treated appropriately with either radical surgery or radiation therapy. We still remain there. But individualization to reduce therapy-associated morbidity should be the main goal. 
Prognostic factors should be used to select patients for either surgery or RT to minimize the increased risk of toxicity. And although we don't use these procedures in the FIGO staging process, because FIGO feels you have to use processes which can be used universally, and many cervical cancers are in developing countries. However, the modern imaging techniques do give you some sense of direction as to which are the patients who will require which type of adjuvants, and you can use this for better uh, selection, for pre-op uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy, and so on, to be able to identify those patients who will benefit from surgery. And with that, I thank you for a patient hearing.